Hi, my name is Rob Garrison. I'm the CEO of Mercado Labs. Welcome to the 11th edition of the First Things First podcast, where we interview thought leaders from across venture, media, and industry. Last month's guest was Scott Felsenfeld. Scott is the fourth generation and CEO of Whitmore Industries. And Whitmore is an incredible company. They make home organization supplies and sell to big retailers like Target, Container Store, Amazon, et cetera. Just a really great company. I encourage you to check them out. It was an amazing episode, and I would encourage you to check out Scott's comments about the supply chain industry. One of my favorite quotes from Scott was, supply chain used to be a department at Whitmore, and now it's our company. And I really think that resonates with most people, especially with what we've gone through in the last couple of years. So for today's guest, I'd like to welcome John Fitzgerald. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Rob. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, really, really looking forward to this, John. So uh, just for an introduction for everybody, John's got more than 40 years in the supply chain industry. And I refer to John as the Kevin Bacon of the supply chain industry, actually, because I've never met anybody who doesn't know John or isn't at least not more than six degrees of separation from John. So that's my my name, my uh, endearing name or, or respectful name for John is the Kevin Bacon of supply chain industry. I first met John at the very beginning of my career uh, based on a recommendation from a client, actually a mutual client in Chicago. And so Jackie from Spiegel said, Rob, you have to meet this guy. He's incredible. And John, hopefully, hopefully you remember that. <laughs> what, I, what I would say is Jackie was right. And I've been a huge fan of John's ever since. So John's had an amazing career and life in the supply chain industry, which I can't do justice to. So I'm going to let John kind of give you his journey. But what I can say is that he's always been on the forefront or the leading edge of really innovative companies. I don't know if that was by design or by chance, but he worked for a company at the beginning of his career that was super innovative in their space, really a trendsetter. Progressed to a couple of technology uh, companies that were also on the leading edge and, and now currently works for a company who's just setting the industry on fire. So John's not only a great person and, and lots of experience in the industry, but he's also been able to work for some really progressive, <coughs> innovative companies. So you'll hear that journey. So with that, John, uh, could you please walk us through uh, your remarkable journey in this industry? And you can start anywhere you want and go anywhere you want. Take your time. Well, great. Well, well thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, my, my mother wrote that for you. I know that. You're being very modest because I've learned as much from you and more in the years oh, uh, as, as we go back. Uh, your experience is tremendous on both the shipper side and uh, the FedExes and uh uh, uh, obviously Sears and Michaels. In fact, you even fired us at Michaels when you were. <laughs> you don't have to bring that up. Yeah. But uh, I love, I love the, uh, I love the name of this first things first, uh, cause you know, you and I agree on the, on this issue that uh, I actually won a debate in 2013 at Northwestern on last mile when I talked all about first mile. And I said, if the first mile I isn't right, there is no last mile, there is no fulfillment, there is no direct to consumer. So uh, so I really do like that. But uh, yeah, I think to talk about my career, certainly I didn't major in uh, supply chain. It, it didn't even exist. <laughs> I'll go back to my college days. It's, uh, I was in um, marketing and data processing was my minor. <laughs> oh, man. That's what they called it then. And we would uh, do programming in Fortran and COBOL and 1402 punch cards. And I'm about as far from being a software developer as, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> my, my kids all say, Dad, I can't believe you're in technology. You can't even work the TV remote. <laughs> but but I, I, did, I did start in the technology side with IBM. And I was with IBM. And then, uh, well, Vietnam hit. And I went in the Marines. I was a captain in the Marines. And for whatever reason, right or wrong, when I got back, I said, I think transportation is the future. And I went to airborne freight, which is no longer yeah. around, but uh, it's the DHL of today. Yeah. But when I got there, I've always been two things, customer focused and think outside the box. And uh, when I got there, it was obvious you'd go in and make a sales call. Then I'd say, hey, I want all your air freight. And they said, we don't have any air freight. We just ship ocean. I said, oh my God. So what I did, I ran the terminal at O'Hare Field for airborne. So I brought in a uh, ocean freight forwarder, Midwest Overseas. I brought in Customs and gave them an office. I, I brought in uh, Harry F. Lawn, which was a local broker. I don't even know if they're around anymore. And I told our salespeople, we're selling multimodal. We're selling everything. <laughs> really? I didn't hear that. I never heard that story. That's yeah, great. So, uh, so anyway, I was there. Airborne not only didn't buy my multimodal vision, <laughs> uh, they went and bought airplanes. And I said, oh, this isn't the place for me. I don't want to be in just selling 
air, you know, airspace. So um, that's when uh, uh, Fritz companies came along and um, they already had, they were the largest customs broker. They did ocean freight. Uh, so they had more services and they needed someone to start air freight. So I started Fritz air freight in Chicago. Hey, John, can I pause you just for one second? Yeah. Um, I talked about all the innovative companies you worked for and really beginning with Fritz. Do you mind before you finish your story, just telling everybody Fritz doesn't exist anymore. It's now UPS supply chain. Ah, good. Can, can yeah. you give everybody a little bit of what is Fritz? Cause Fritz at one time was, was the company in this yeah. industry. Great, great. Uh, I'm sorry for jumping ahead there. So uh, it was Arthur J Fritz and companies became Fritz companies of uh, 1933. They were a spinoff from the old Harper Robinson. And they were a uh, regional um, customs broker that had offices in San Francisco, L.A. And then they started expanding after the war to uh, when different ports would close down or during the war. And they moved to uh, New Orleans and the East Coast and ended up with about 60 offices around the United States, the largest customs broker in the United States. Uh, we were one point five billion when uh, UPS bought us in 2001. Uh, Expeditors was uh, a distant uh Second, they were about 500 million at the time. You just yeah. can't resist that, Jack, can you? No, I can't. I can't. <laughs> but uh, so, but Lynn Fritz was a visionary, and he said, "We can't just be a customs broker. We have to help these customers with." Uh, I mean, he was talking supply chain. There wasn't the name for it, but end to end, when we were there back in the 80s, and um, and we said, "Hey, you know, we're going to clear it for you. We may as well fly it for you. We'll do the origin cargo." Cons I remember going in 19, well, early 70s <laughs> to Taiwan, setting up, uh, you know, origin consolidation management and tracking POs. I mean, obviously, all manual then. Of course, as you know, many customers are still manual, aren't they? Yeah, that's um, right. But anyway, then we expanded, and when I was there, I said, well, "We got to offer more." So we I added on. Um, uh, warehousing distribution. We started doing that. Um, we ended up with about 30 million square foot in warehousing. We did, uh, I added on um, duty drawback, uh, marine insurance. I was a marine insurance broker. So anything the customer needed, we tried to become a one-stop shop. So that was nice. Fritz. That was Fritz. But then we got bought by UPS and we become part of a, you know, obviously a, a big, big company. And uh, I'd learned the value of technology when I was at Fritz, because we were one of the first companies that actually started talking about visibility, even though we didn't have any of the tools we have today. I mean, it was really an EDI environment, as you know. Um, and when I got to um, UPS, they certainly had a lot of technology, but most of it was for themselves internally, you know, to manage their own yeah. business, not necessarily for the customer. So, um, so that's when um, I really changed uh, careers, honestly. And that's when went over to GT Nexus. And as you know, hey, um, John, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause you one more time because you're you're uh, you're selling yourself a little bit short. So when you when Fritz was acquired by UPS, I, I believe in my mind anyway, that was the foundation of what then became supply chain solutions at UPS. Yes. So they created a whole division around that. It, it existed. But I think Fritz was really the impetus for them creating what is now supply chain solutions. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah well, absolutely. It was a kind of a rude awakening for me because I remember being on one of the <laughs> The first calls that all these UPS people are on, I said, well, listen, we're going to have to, you know, uh, move this through the CFCY and, and, and Ningbo, and then we're going to put it on the NVO and track at the SKU level. And they said, stop, stop. What is all that? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember a lot of that, right? A lot of uh, explanations. Yeah. Right? Then, I, then I remembered that they were just tracking packages in brown trucks. Uh, life, life should be so easy. But uh, yeah. Yeah. so anyway, when I was there, it, it became it just wasn't much fun for me. And I wanted to keep doing things outside the box. So GT Nexus came around and said, hey, you know, we're doing things in the cloud. And I have to admit, I said, what the hell's a cloud? <laughs> you know, so this is two, this is 2010. You know, um, I was still going to the bank, cashing my checks. You know, and they're talking about, you know, <laughs> and something didn't you get PayPal, uh, PayPal and Elon Musk and. The rest is history, right? Yeah, that's right. But um, anyway, GT Nexus was uh, really providing that uh, connectivity. Unfortunately, all EDI, not modern technology, but connectivity to the factories, to the PO, and providing that that element to it. And it was really, uh, you know, a good company. And as you know, then sold to N4, and then became part of a, a another larger organization that wasn't directly focused on on supply chain and, and the kind of things that you live every day. Um, and I, at the time, was trying to get GT Nexus to say, hey, I think we should be doing APIs. I heard APIs are what the finance, you know, has used for 20 years, and we're still doing EDI, which is 1948 technology from the Berlin airlift. It's one-way <laughs> one communication, 
uh, FedEx told us they had 100 people in um, Memphis on the uh, LTL side just answering calls. Did you get my EDI message? Are you going to pick it up? Is, is there a POD? You know, this all goes away with real-time APIs, as you know. So so that's when Jet McCandless uh, came to me and said, um, hey, you really ought to come here and grow this company. And I said, wow. I said, uh, you, you want me? I'm a dinosaur. You know, I know. He said, we've got all the, we've got all the you know, really, uh, uh, you know, the uh, – very, very smart people, I'll call them. I'm data scientists now. We have 30 data scientists. And as you know, I've been teaching forever. I do believe in lifelong learning and learning something new every, do, every day, as we all do, if we're listening. And uh, But I, I, when I came down here to Florida, uh, Florida Gulf Coast University didn't have a uh, supply chain program. I met the dean over a beer, and I said, hey, I'll help you start it. So we started it, and I presented to the dean and all the professors. And down here, they have no tenure. So if they don't do a good job, they're out. So I presented in 2016. I wish I had a camera when I told them all your books are outdated. Uh, technology, <laughs> technology can't be a separate track. It's got to be integrated with operations management. That's supply chain. And I said, in five years, you'll be graduating data scientists. Well, they started graduating data scientists a couple of years ago. So it's, it's really changed. I saw an ad this morning, the Dolphins, Miami Dolphins. I'm a Bears fan. They're horrible. But the... Um, <laughs> The dolphins, the dolphins were talking about their data scientists and how they measure all the speed. And I, I remember I spoke in Brazil and I did a whole thing on, on the data science that they use and statistics on Neymar, you know, and on Messi and all the moves they make. And the, all the there's more data on soccer and baseball than there is on supply chain. Yeah, that, we saw Moneyball, right? We both watched Moneyball at one point. Yeah, yeah. right. right. So yeah. anyway, that's uh, I'd say that's really where I where I came. I do believe in uh, there's a tremendous opportunities now for young people in supply chain. It's probably the hottest major around. I'm still active at ASU, sometimes at Penn State, Northwestern. I just spoke a few weeks ago. Um, you know, it's it's a great area, and of course, technology is is a key part of it now. So it's people, process, technology. You can't have one without the other. That's a perfect summary. John, before we go to the next thing, I just uh, I think most of the people on this podcast will know or have heard of Project 44. But just if I could hit the pause button one more time and maybe you talked about APIs, but can you give everybody just a, an overview of who is P44? I, I've been on the sidelines of watching that journey. and It's been incredible, but nobody better than you to kind of highlight uh, who is P44 and what have they become? Well, thank you. Uh, we're not here to talk about P44 today, but I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, Jet McCandles could certainly do a better job. He's the founder. We're eight years old, started in Chicago. Um, and Jet was a, believe it or not, a dispatcher with, I think, Yellow at the time. And uh, when he was in the dispatch office, people would call in and say, when am I getting my shipment? He turned around to his boss and he'd say, tell him 15 minutes. And the next, <laughs> next call would come and he'd say to his boss, when are they going to get it? Tell him 15 minutes. Well, he, re he realized very quickly, they had no idea when the shipments were going to be delivered. So he said, there's got to be a better way. And that's when he really came up with the whole idea of changing the, the transportation industry and visibility so people could see things as real time as possible. EDI was not the way to go. So we're an API first company obviously then enhanced with uh, machine learning, IOTs, if there's devices on the, on the product, um, um, AI, uh, you know, weather, you know, developing predictive ETA so people know when is it going to arrive at the DC or the manufacturing site uh, or the, uh, the store. So it's a connective tissue from first mile. We track all the way from China to Kansas City to your door uh, to last mile. So it's, uh, you know, we're now 1,300 people in 35 countries, uh, it's an amazing ride. When I started, we had 40 people in one office in Chicago. So, oh, my gosh. I didn't know that part of the story. That's amazing. So congrats to you and the success on, on that journey. Let me let me change the direction, if I could, John, just a little bit. So, you know, we everybody knows about the last three years. We, we talk about the last three years a lot. But to me, it almost feels like, you know, it was a snow globe where we sort of everything got picked up and shaken. So what I perceived as a once pretty dependable, reliable industry, the one that we grew up in, the international supply chain, just got completely turned upside down. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear your impression of the last three years and um, how you think a predictable business got turned upside down or even just your thoughts on what happened in the first place. Because, it, I mean, for a person who's been doing this for a long time, like you have, it was remarkable how quickly, in my opinion, that the industry fell apart. Do you have any insight or thoughts on that? Yeah, I call that the year the earth stood, till, stood still, right? <laughs> um, yeah, 
you know, the, obviously, you know, the business uh, as well as or better than I do. I always thought we had infrastructure problems to begin with. Right. So, yeah. But the problem, this problem was so different because it was global. It was ev- I mean, it was everywhere. It was all at once. It's not like a hurricane in Florida. I live in Florida. So if we got a hurricane. Yeah, we're all concerned. The rest of you in the country don't give a damn. But, <laughs> but with with, uh, with, you know, the pandemic and the supply chain, it was impacting all of us. And I, you know, uh, I was actually speaking in Northwest and I'll never forget it. No, November 10th of uh, 21. That's the Marine Corps birthday. And the president came out and said, we're going to solve the problem. The, they're going to be open 24 hours. And I went, oh, my God. Geez, you know, the terminals all independently owned. They're going to say no way. Uh, the, the, there's nowhere to put the containers. There's no trucks to pick them up. The warehouses aren't open. So we we had this this you know obviously as you know domino effect, uh, uh, and so it didn't it it didn't surprise me the severity of it did. I mean because I always knew that someday it's going to break. I mean when you're loading 60 containers an hour in Ningbo and you're only unloading 15 an hour in LA, you got a problem. <laughs> you got a problem if there's no problem, right? So. And it hasn't ended, right? I mean, that contract's not signed. The rail's still, you know, I mean, so we have some issues there. But, yeah, it was uh, it was very interesting. Uh, you may have heard the comment now, um, the, the never normal. That's what we're living in now. Peter Henson has coined that, the never normal. It's never going to go back to normal. So it's all about how resilient are you? How good is your information? How real time is it? How are you sharing that information across your your uh, your teams? And, and what happened? We had, we had customers, what I saw happen is we had customers calling and say, we don't know where our shipments are. What do you mean you know where your shipments are? Well, we use, <laughs> we use, we use five steamship lines and 10 forwarders and four brokers. And we got Excel spreadsheets that are out of date and we have to call them. And I go, oh my God, you know, so it became very apparent that people did, did not know where their stuff was, did not know where's my order, couldn't tell their customers, which as you know, caused problems, you know, all the empty shelves. So I'm not going to rehash all that, but um, it became evident that um, customers that told us, hey, we'll talk to you, Project 44, in yeah, two or three years. They're calling us saying, hey, what can we do now? What can we do now? <laughs> my CEO saying, where's all my stuff? I can't tell them. <laughs> so, um, so we actually got pushed up. I would say visibility got pushed up. Maybe they were going to do a TMS and we were going to be next. We always said, hey, you can do them. You know, one doesn't have to be one after the other. So we started implementing companies and giving them visibility. Uh, to where their stuff was, even though a TMS would probably take 18 months and we were up in, you know, six, eight weeks. So, yeah, Yeah, let me, so two things I'd like to kind of weave off of that question. So you said something super interesting to me. I guess I hadn't thought about it the same way you said it, which is from your perspective, none of these challenges we faced were new. They just got radically exposed when things got turned upside down. Would that be a fair? All and all at once. Because and all at you know, once. We, we used to have a disruption here. Well, that was only in Liverpool, you know, or it's in Korea, like right now, right? Uh, this was everywhere. So it, it became a problem globally. And the other thing you said that I, you know, I just want to make sure the audience understands is that even though there's not a connected tissue, which there should be, the supply chain is not much different than a human body in that everything in some way or another is interconnected, right? And just because things aren't connected doesn't mean if you hurt your hand, there's not going to be an impact somewhere else in terms of what you can do. And so you also talked about one domino fell and another domino fell because the infrastructure wasn't good to begin with. And when it started to get exposed all at once, the problems were exacerbated by the fact that things weren't connected. Is that also a fair assessment or am I? Absolutely. I mean, it, it is really it really is a network. It's an ecosystem. Call it different things, but we are all interconnected. There's no one. Yeah, you know, we're a data aggregator. We get that data to great systems like yours or from you uh, into other systems of record. It's sharing that data. So we all have that look. A lot of customers got caught with uh, all their eggs in one basket in China. So they were really hurting. And so now if they're going to do, as you know, they're going to start uh, doing dual sourcing, multiple sourcing, move to Vietnam, India, uh, you know, uh, Mex- Mexico or reshoring, whatever you want to call it. It's depending on the situation. This this could, you know, they've got all new suppliers, new carriers, new communication. And they're doing a lot of this manually, you know, sending emails with PDFs. I mean, my God, it's got to be a nightmare. <laughs> so that's why. But people don't think of the things that have to be done to make that work. And that's where people like you come in and we come in, um, you know, it's, and you know, they're talking about, you know, moving the chips back here. It takes years to build a chip chip factory. So what do you do in the meantime? So this is uh, this is the challenge that all of us have together to work through. Well, you, you might've preempted my next question, but what I was thinking about as you were talking and, and the question I had for you in advance is 
if you look at all those things that we expose and all those things that were broken and all those things that were mismatched and your explanation of why they were mismatched, my question was around the role that technology either didn't play because it didn't exist and or the role that you see it will play going forward. And you've kind of touched on both of those. But if you yeah. if you could put a pin on that, what would you say about the role of technology as a path forward? Because I couldn't agree with you more that the, the networks are complex. There's lots and lots of data lots and lots of providers, it needs to be connected. So so how do you see that coming together? Do you think that's yeah. through partnerships or do you think there's gonna be a company that's gonna emerge that can put this all together? Uh, I don't think there's any one silver bullet. I think I really, th we call it network wide collaboration that we all have network to- Network wide collaboration, okay. You need, I, I wrote a, a little white paper called Little Data Eats Big Data for Lunch. And the whole the whole point of that was that you need all the data to, to solve, uh, you know, if you optimize one area, sub-optimize another. So you really need to look at the whole, the whole supply chain, don't you? So, yes. uh, you know, I, I remember when I was a for forwarder, you call on somebody and he'd say, hey, I want the cheapest rate you got. And then I go talk to the sales manager and she says, I want the fastest service you got. Well, wait a minute, you're not going to get that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I, I think technology, the role it can play is to, to really move us from a manual environment to a digital environment where you see everything together. I call it a, a fishbowl. Uh, you know, you're seeing, we're all seeing the same data. We might want to look at it differently if I'm a buyer, right? And I'm looking for these ugly shirts, you know, for Father's Day or something. <laughs> I don't know where they are. The transportation guy and the DC manager, when's that coming here? When do I unload it? I got to plan my labor. You know, I don't want the tension to merge. I mean, there's so many aspects where the data can help people you know, solve these issues. Uh, it used to be, as you know, I mean, I started with transportation, then logistics, now supply chain. People are looking at total cost. And as you know, it, it used to be, you said on both sides, uh, it used to be really cost driven. Now it's things like customer experience, productivity of my employees. Uh, you know, everybody has less employees. What can we automate here to take these mundane tra uh, activities off these people, right? Um, you know, where can we better collaborate? What about sustainability? We have more and more customers want our CO2 emissions data so they can decide in their bids, who do they use? What ocean carrier? What truck carrier? Um, so it's uh, so significantly more complexity. And I just go back to your statement uh, at the beginning. Uh, you said if the first mile is right, the final mile is not going to be there. But another way you could say it is the pitch and a catch. And so being able to make sure you know who the pitcher is and the catcher is helps you resolve a lot of the issues that you talked about. So. Let me move to a, to a different uh, direction, John, if I could. We've got about uh, eight minutes left. But if you could give us your crystal ball, where do you see the next big challenges coming from? Do you think it's going to be, uh, you started to talk about consumer activism when you talk about brands and ESG. Is it going to be China? Is it going to be the Europe-Ukraine issue? Or are these the type of things that we should um, be looking at now? Is it keeping customers awake? Where, where do you see this whole industry had it. So we had an industry that was relatively predictable, but broken. We saw that thing shaken up. And now to your point, we've got even more challenges coming upon us than we've ever had before. So if you had a crystal ball, what do you, what do you see us doing differently to keep up with all of that? Well, <clears throat> I don't know how you feel about this, but our CEO jet says we are 1% of the way there. Um, I, 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 I just think in talking to people that, I'll bet you they're on 5% of the companies that are truly digital in their supply chain. They still have many manual workarounds, different systems. Uh, I, won't, I won't mention one client, but they said, oh, yeah, we just built a data lake and we connected our 13 internal systems. And I said, yeah, can you tell me where your PO, PO is in, in Indonesia? Oh, don't have a clue. 80% <laughs> 80, 80 of the data that a company needs to manage their supply chain is outside the four walls. So until you connect all of that, so I think that's the the opportunity. I, I already started talking about China, and if you if you start um, you know uh, moving to new areas, you're still gonna you're still gonna have to have a, a you know something like uh, Mercado to to onboard those suppliers and have visibility to it. Um, with the inflation coming, uh, we we feel it's going to get worse. As you're already seeing a ton of layoffs, Amazon, etc. It's going to get worse. Uh, we we see it uh, through at least half of, if not more, of uh, 23. People are going to have less people. They're going to have to do more with less. They're going to have to automate more and automate from the first mile to the last mile, wherever they can. Uh, actually, it makes their, their employees' lives much better when they can be working with new technology and not old green bars. Yeah, and, worker satisfaction is a big one for sure. Yeah. So th that, I think uh, we're getting a lot of requests for, again, I mentioned the emissions and uh, that area is very important. The more 
pressure, especially from young people on where is it made? Is it conflict minerals, slave labor? Um, we can't address all of that, but we came out with a, uh, index. I'm hearing a sound here. <laughs> uh, we, we came out with a um, index uh, with the University of Tennessee was announced uh, last month. Uh, sustainability is called Fleet Sustainability Index. And you've probably heard of Smartway. They track about 4,000 vehicles. Well, we track 500,000 vehicles in the U.S. and can tell you the, uh, the make, the model, the CO2. And so companies are now using that data when they do RFPs. Who's the right carrier for me to use, not just on service and cost, but what's their impact on the environment? So uh, I think it all gets back to um, to that. Um, right now, the focus is, is definitely on cost because of what's happening with inflation. Customer delivery, we started to see a, a change there. Uh, a net promoter score, customer satisfaction, where chief supply chain officers were asking us how our visibility could improve their net promoter scores to their customers. That's you know, great. Uh, tr truthfully, that's when we bought Convey in Austin, Texas, which does last mile technology, uh, last mile delivery. And uh, part of what they do is uh, they say, hey, Rob, are you happy with that delivery from Neiman Marcus? Will you use them again? So... And, and ultimately, John, isn't that what it's all about? You know, we've talked about all the supply chain -y stuff, but isn't it about these customers being able to give better service to their customers? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, well, it all starts with the customer. I always say work at the start with the customer, work backwards. There you go. That's I perfect. Mean, I, I really think that's it. I know I know we talked about um, you. Maybe it's another question, but it's about what's going to happen with freight forwarders, what's going to happen with the carriers. Uh, yeah. Everybody, that's my next it. question. Thanks for leading that. How, everybody is on that. Everybody's buying into everybody. Maersk and CMA have invested in us, Project 44. Um, I think the, the key thing there is you, you lived it. You saw uh, APL and Sealand and uh, the acquisitions through the years. And um, have they, is it really one unified platform? That's going to be the thing. What's the experience to the customer? If I buy 10 different freight forwarders, what's my experience? Are those 10 different platforms? Can you give me visibility end to end? Uh, the big forwarders are going to get bigger. They're going to have the same challenge as they acquire people. Is it, what's the experience for the customer? And can you really give me the information, uh, you know, quickly? Niche forwarders, I always thought, always going to be in there. Somebody specializes in chemicals, trade shows, projects, uh, you know, wine and spirits. Uh, they provide a level of service that those industries want, and they want that personal touch. So I think there's always going to be a, a room for the intermediary. And certainly NVOs saved a lot of people's butts last year when the carriers were. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Right? So there's, there's always a, play, uh, a place for that, I think. Uh, but technology, regardless if you're a niche player, the technology is still going to be very key. Customers now expect that Amazon-type experience. Where's my shipment? When's it going to be here? You know, um, that's what and I that, see. that might have answered my last question for you. I kind of was trying to save the best for last, which is where do you see technology in the next five years? And so I'll summarize a couple of things that you said that I thought were really critical. One is there's still not enough connect tissue, connective tissue in between companies. And so from the customer experience standpoint, to get one forwarder here and one carrier there and so forth is really difficult for them. So who's going to provide that connective tissue? I think is one thing you're saying. The other thing is connecting uh, the First to final mile, I think that's really important. We're buying products in one place and selling them in another. So those two things need to be bridged. And then I think the third thing that, that I heard you say, John, that I think is, is really interesting is that it's not just even for sales. It's also for your brand reputation, for your worker satisfaction. So do you feel like, the, I guess my last question is, do you feel like the industry is finally ready, the supply chain industry and or the customers who have supply chains to make that digital transformation? Do you think this will finally be the time? Maybe this is you know step one if only 1% of the companies are digitized and 80% of the data is outside of their company. So use two more quotes from you. Do you think this is finally the time that they'll take this journey and take it seriously? Do you, you, you sort of, you, you talk to everybody, do you sort of feel like there's more of a receptivity or a groundswell towards, for the first yeah. time, really taking this seriously and addressing it? Again, I think that the whole uh, pandemic and disruption uh, accelerated that for the companies that are leaders. You always see that in every industry. Who are the leaders? Who are the followers? Who are the laggards? Yeah. I think the leaders are jumped on it. The followers are coming faster than they used to, and the laggards are still can't figure it out. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, okay. it's, it's amazing to me. But I, I think that the opportunity for all of us is, uh, you know, our mission statement is we make supply chains work. Not alone, but together with everybody in it, the shippers, the yourselves, uh, you know, the ERP systems, uh, the forwarders, we all have to work together, share information. You know, that's 
that's something was not very well done, you know, 30 years ago. Nobody wanted yeah. to share anything. You know? right. I mean, it, it's, it's really changed. So I think that's uh, the big opportunity. I know speed, speed of technology is really key. So when I got to Project 44, um, it took us months to onboard one truck carrier, right? We now do 1,500 a week and 50% of those in two to three hours. So that speed is incredible. And now we're coming out with something called low code analytics, whereas it used to, if you had to put a dashboard together, it might take months. Well, we can now do it in a week. You know, so I think all of those type of things are really key. How do we use new digital technology to provide better um, information to our mutual customers? And how is that data used further downstream? As I said, you initialize the purchase order, we track it, we get it back to you. We maybe get it to a planning system, a control tower, we feed data already to SAP and Oracle and Blue Yonder and 09 and Canaxis planning systems that use that real-time data to improve their, their rapid response and what people should do. So it's really data-driven decisions with more current information. You know, companies who are using historical information from three years ago, I, mean, I don't know what they were even looking at, you know. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to close on that. No, you heard it directly from John Fitzgerald make decisions with data-driven empirical data and the technology companies make it easier to consume your products and make it faster. So uh, John, just, it's been a delight. Uh, it, I smiled when I thought about this episode because you're one of my favorite people in the industry. I really appreciate your time. I know the audience will appreciate all your learnings and we'll post uh, your contact information, John. I know you're a teacher, so hopefully it's okay if yep. somebody wants to reach out to you for more information, you're okay with us uh, providing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We're all in this. We're all in this together. John, thank you very much.